welcome to the Frequencies Podcast with your host, Jonah Dempsey. I am visited today by special guest Indra Singh. And I met Indra when he was traveling in the US. So um, he's a really interesting guy. I was just blown away by his depth of experience at such an early age and uh, just just his vast interest in humanity and human interaction. Um, he studied under uh, Vandana Shiva. And he's been a TV show host and a journalist and working in a lot of really interesting areas. But today I'm going to be asking him what it was like being an anonymous traveler in America. And so, Indra, thank you for being with me. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So what was it like? <laughs> what was it like being in the States? You, you traveled a bit. You came to Santa Fe. You were in Denver uh, before that. If there's any other country that I can say is home-like for me that I just love, hmm. just the land, just like the kindness that I've received. It's actually America. Oh, that's and, wonderful to hear. That's wonderful. And of course, kindness doesn't come easy. And then there were, there were times that I was like also dealt with very brutal experiences and many times just the feeling of being invisible. You know, when I walked around cities and walked around the big liberal towns, I actually found more love and heart and like, the south of all places the least racism the least like real people in like the southwest like the best kind of people actually that's my little joke the best kind of like white folk there are that are in some, like santa fe new mexico <laughs> uh well um you know that makes a lot of sense to me because i call this place home but also it does make sense that the south in general it was homier because even here in the u.s we kind of have this idea of the south of being southern hospitality that, that people are very hospitable and the North can be kind of inhospitable and too busy. You know, if you go to New York City, everyone's just busy, busy, busy. So, did, did but you? That's just like my, but that's like my little joke. Like, I think yeah. that the real learning I learned from America is like how a culture matures ecologically from the cent, like settler colonial culture, which which came aboard like ships mm. and even farm in like Charlestown, Virginia. That's why you need to get those like the colored people in to like farm your farms. And from there, you're developing today, America is the pioneer of like regenerative agriculture. Mm. Believe it or not, like some of the most like modern like integration with like ecology, economy in a, in a very real sense. And, I, and I'm talking about experiences actually at farms in Virginia, Daniel Griffith's farm, and then visiting Wendell Berry twice in Kentucky and also meeting... Um, I believe he's the grandfather of the organic movement, Joe Salatin. Really? So you were kind of doing a tour of eco pioneers and agricultural pioneers then, and you were you were connecting with different people. Um, and, and that also is pagan, like biodynamic people, like you know, like it's really funny. Like now, like in the, the prime industrial culture, like the world's first, like Rome of today, like you know, America. <laughs> The, the top industrial force in the world has pagans which who, who believe in farming with the spirit. So it's it's, it's absolutely a very experience. I've had some biodynamic wine where they actually pour cow's blood into the soil every full moon in a sort of pagan ritual. And uh, no, it is interesting how yeah we we are like this modern day Rome, as you say, and and we have this dark shadow of colonialism, um, but also have this avant garde. Um, culture that is still uh, seemingly, you know, alive and interesting pockets. You don't really think of Virginia as an avant-garde place, but when it comes to agriculture, maybe they are doing some interesting things and, and you've had some insight into that. That's wonderful. So did you visit the big cities like New York City or Los Angeles? Did you go? Yeah. No, you, you skipped those. Didn't. You just went straight to Virginia. No, actually, my first experience in America was in 2006. I was uh, part of, as a cultural exchange student in in a private school in LA, Chadwick, and ah. and that was my first learning. You know, we only watched American television. We watched the Mean Girls. We watched all your movies. <laughs> Growing up, like you know, we we're like, wow, American America high school is like this, and then you land up actually in the American high school, and you realize color for the first time. You realize where you are in the hierarchy. You realize why certain people are looked upon like and why you're not. Suddenly from being the top in your country, you become the bottom in the other people's country. 
and you because don't you're, because you weren't white because of sort of yeah because there are built in i mean I, that yeah. was shocking to me in, in my high school um well we had a very diverse high school we were very alternative but there was a, a high school across the street that was kind of the more mainstream one and it, it actually got in trouble because it was this was in the 90s and it was still so segregated it had two floors and the bottom floor it was very segregated but most of the white students were going on the top floor i had a friend who um ended up on the bottom floor. And so it was an interesting experience for him because it was all based on placement and testing, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, it's like, there were like two different schools in one, if you placed in this one floor or the other. Um, but yeah, I, I think also just certain parts of town. I mean, it can be, it can be shocking to me how segregated it still is here, how there's certain neighborhoods where white neighborhoods or black neighborhoods or different, different cultures, it's very segregated. And it sounds like you experienced that in LA, but the school itself wasn't as segregated. You just experienced racism or kind of from the other students or. It's just like a, it's a tacit, it's a, it's a tacit system, you know, you don't need to talk about it. it. Even if the rules don't allow it to exist, but the social norms uh, forge it to be a reality. Right. You, 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 can't, you, you, you can't make a law. It's just kind of what's happening in the culture because people are, are still at that level of development, perhaps, that they haven't... Yeah. No, like, let, let's talk about Malcolm X, man. And and I think maybe some of the viewers will associate with that. Like, mm -hmm. Malcolm X's autobiography talks about uh, very why there's a fascination about of black colored people and for white women. Like, mm -hmm. so suddenly, if you have a white girlfriend in a black neighborhood, your, like, prestige rises. And I'm not saying this. This is Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, whether whether black you know the, the dynamic between the colored people and the black people african americans in america and white people in america has been brutal like everyone knows this as a fact but yet nevertheless if you date a white woman that's considered to be social prestige so mm -hmm. it's i think the the colonial racism is, is so imbibed in the soul and the heart of america at this point that whether you whether there is a law or not the sheep will automatically come together and and form that flock, whether irrespective of the shepherd or not. You see, I do, I do. Yeah, there are certain things that we can't legislate. It's, um, I mean, something that I believe with human design is a system that touches one person at a time, and we've kind of left behind the era of the mass movement or the era of a huge group of people all coming together to follow one leader. Now it's like one person at a time. And so when we look at these kind of issues, we're not going to solve it through a mass movement. We're going to solve it through each individual person finding in their own heart, their own, basically facing their own shadow, uh, whether that shadow is racism and prejudice or whether um, they're wealthy and they're looking down on those who are impoverished or whether they're back to land hippies and they're looking down on people who use technology, right? There's going to be different levels of prejudice, not to make all of those equal, because of course, some of them have financial power and some of them have, um, you know, institutionalized racism and things like that, 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 that support those. But, um, but it really is now a question of each of us as individuals. We've, our time in history has changed uh, from being the mass movement we're kind of beyond mass movements, I think, unless maybe you've seen some mass movements that, that I'm not aware of. I mean, we still have them, right? There's still movements that happen. I know um, there's there's a movement uh, for psychedelic science, for instance. We had the MAPS conference, which you were covering as, as, as a journalist, which is something else that, that was interesting to me. I, I really wanted to attend uh, this huge conference up in Denver. And I mean, but I'm also skeptical of mass movements. I would want to attend probably as you did for the people to connect, to talk to the people, to kind of have so many smart people in a room together, so many interesting uh, people who are free thinkers and who aren't really thinking the same way. But I'm also very skeptical when it turns into a mass movement where, oh, we're going to um, change this whole country through the use of pharmaceutical psychedelics. I don't know that I, I follow that. So what was the conference like? Uh, you were there for the whole time, right? You, you got to attend and kind of experience. 10,000 people tripping in a convention center. 10,000? I didn't realize it was that. that point incredible. of time. And 12,000 people attended it. Like, wow. So <laughs> you can imagine that, like how that was like. And the police were everywhere. But I, at that conference, I realized that Republicans can really talk.
we saw former Texan governor Rick Perry, and he stole the show. It was mm. Gerard like Polis, who was like the governor of Colorado. And he's the guy who's actually leading it with action. And this guy walks in like suited Republican, smooth talking devil, like, you know, and he wins the show. Like people are standing up, giving him like standing ovations, like, like, hey, you're the man. Wow. So all that, but also the corporatism, like uh, I, I think the real problem, which is which is loneliness in America. And somehow the the feeling that people get that through money, they can buy a community. And the maps is in a larger form, providing that platform for all these lonely souls to come together and actually justify their existence as a psychedelic community. And it's just like the 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 profitability that they're kind of seeking. And I'm, I'm sure MAPS doing great work and they're working for it. So it's not like a dish on them, but the, corporate, the, the, the corporatized side, which is like, you know, $1,800 tickets or $2,000 tickets or $800 tickets, that's like someone's monthly pay. Like, you you understand that's like a lot of money yeah so of course those elements are wrong the given the fact that america has a complete monopoly america instituted the drug treaty and yet it it allowed for other countries it, it forced other countries to ban their own sacred plants while american corporations have a, a whole headway of patents and other like intellectual property and like uh, manufacturing advantages before this uh, all these sacred plants are made legal all over the world so it's kind of a mafia tactic which is which the US government has played and now it's benefiting American corporations. The maps is nothing but another exhibition of that corporatism, which is which has banned our secret plans, kept mm. people of color away from their sacredness while instituting alcohol on us, while giving us yeah. the you know drugs which were traded by the East India Company. As, yeah, as here's, here's coffee to work harder and here's alcohol to stay sedated. But not and tobacco. You know, Let's not forget or, tobacco. And here's tobacco as well. Yeah, that will keep your, that will calm your nerves while you work. It's very much, uh, yeah. These are the drugs of of the kind of working and and of just, yeah. There's it's such a difference. Um, no, that's a really wonderful point as well about the the deep loneliness that people feel and the disconnection and then the replacement of human connection with striving for money. In the hopes that the money will be the stand-in for the fulfillment of desire um, but the desire is so vague and ambiguous people don't really know what they desire so they just desire more money it's like this great irony it's like i need money so i can get what i want well what do you want well i'm not sure about that yet i, I need the money first and then i'll figure it out but they don't ever figure it out they they're lonely and they're disconnected and so they're looking for something um, and trying to buy it it actually reminds me of something the great French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, he famously would turn down very wealthy clients. And he was asked why. And he said, because the rich only know how to buy. They don't know how to pay. And if you want to actually go to therapy, you have to pay. You have to pay with your heart and soul and with your being. And, and so many people don't know how to pay. And so they're trying to buy their way into something. But it seems like it was kind of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, it is providing something for all of these people who would have been kind of considered freaks or outsiders. They get to come together. On the other hand, I guess the double-edged sword is the tickets are so expensive that it's, it's, yeah, it's sort of business as usual for corporate America. They're like, how do we monetize on this now? There's a bunch of people who are against marketing. Let's market to them. You know, there's a bunch of outsiders. Let's, Let's find, so that is an interesting thing. At the same time, as much as that can be a problem, it's pretty cool just that the amount of people to bring together, like the fact you're there with all of these kind of big names of psychedelic research. And I think there were, I knew people from the archetypal astrology community. So you had people from Pacifica Graduate Institute and the Institute for Integral Studies and Esalen and all of these. America's kinds of cream, America's alternative cream. Let me just say, say it in the, like simple language. The best your country has to offer, the most 10,000, 12,000 most beautiful specimens in the alternative world, they were all there. Yeah, I believe it. I saw photos. I was like, I know that person. I, oh, geez, you know, I, I wanted to be there. I was, um, I was on my way to Burning Man at the time, which is another controversial corporate alternative event, but a lot of beautiful specimens of human nature and a lot of very creative people as well. And then you have Elon Musk. So, you know, you have to take the good with the bad. <laughs> Balance, right? The arbitraries, huh? 
you can't have so many beautiful artists and not have Elon Musk hanging out to kind of balance the scales, you know. Hey, he owns X. You can't beat that. Uh, uh, well, so just, this is, just, just to kind of pick up on your last point, like if you don't mind me, like me jumping in, I love that. Yeah, like, like just two movies, and I'm just saying this in like slight fun. Also, if you watch the American Psycho and Fight Club, those are like two very seminal movies that actually describe the American problem very well. And sadly, that problem is no longer American, and and that problem is now a global problem wherever the American education, American television, American ideas have traveled to, and that's why. Uh, we may be different colored, but we are actually American inside. Like, that's the other joke I have. Like, you can find friends being watched, like, in a million other countries. People know Angelina Jolie, like, she was their sister. Like, uh, you see? Or, sorry, yeah. like, all the American actresses and no, actors. No, no, it's, it's become like part of... Everywhere. Yeah, it's become such a cultural, like, culturalist... Cultures have... There are separate cultures that have retained tradition, but that they are all partaking in a sort of global monoculture now as well, which is kind of originated from the American westward expansion of colonialism and things like that. Um, the but American just, Empire. Yeah, the, the American Empire. The but, American people also. But there is also an aspect of the American <laughs> colonialism that is self deconstructive or there's some interesting things that happened i really like the french philosopher gilles deleuze in his book a thousand plateaus with felix guattari he talks about what is unique about the american west coast and he says there were basically two great diasporas out of africa and one went to the east and one went to the west and the one to the east was five thousand years ago so the one to the west and now he's not he does account for indigenous peoples but that was the first diaspora. The second great diaspora westward only really finished in like 1900. That was the westward diaspora that's so much more recent that resulted in Los Angeles and Portland and, and mm -hmm. Seattle and <laughs> Vancouver, British Columbia. And yes, there was a lot of horrific colonial rule, but there was also an interesting nuance of the historical circumstances that the people that ended up going the furthest west were essentially leaving behind the history. So it's kind of like as you go east across the United States and get to the Eastern Seaboard and New York and Boston and Philadelphia and so on, it feels like you're going back in time. It feels like you're going 200 years back in time. And you get to London, it feels like you're in 1850. You get to Paris, it feels like you're in turn of the century, right? And you kind of go to this old world and it's this interesting time warp. Now he, he lived in Paris, he lived in France, so he, he was ambivalent. Obviously, um, there was a lot of Eurocentrism as well, which is part of that same empire. And I, but I don't, and I don't think Deleuze made any excuses for that. I mean, especially with Felix Guattari, who is a real, um, a really interesting guy. I don't know if you know much about Guattari, but you, you might have approved of him. They ended up after the student protests of May 1968 they fought to be given Le Board, which was a psychiatric institution for people who are mostly schizophrenic. And it's outside of Paris, you know, and they basically took it over. And well, especially Guattari, who lived out there, he um, turned it into a anarcho-communist, polyamorous, um, experimental utopia, where all of the patients became all of the teachers and the instructor and the people, you know, and they and all the workers, like they became their own supervisors. Everything was kind of was anarchist. And one of his main rules was no monogamy. So he had his team of what he called erotic kamikazes, and they would send new students from the colleges, you know, fresh faced students to come here to learn psychiatry, working with real schizophrenics who were all dropping acid, by the way. So they're all of the, the, the teachers were dropping LSD with the with, and the, the teachers and the students and the patients, they kind of blurred all the boundaries. Like they didn't really believe in the difference of roles as much. And then Guattari, who's a very controversial figure, he had his team of erotic kamikazes. When a couple would show up, he would send a man to seduce the woman and send a woman to seduce the man. And he would break them up within the week because he would not allow any monogamy in his commune. <laughs> very interesting figure. So these are people who are very sympathetic to the plight of people who suffered under colonialism and under Western rule and so on. I mean, 
I mean, they were even fighting against the colonialism and the, the you know, indoctrinated oppression in, um, in their own country and so on, but also sort of glamorizing Western United States. And it's just such a funny thing that you get this dichotomy of, of the U.S. being such an imperial thing, but also containing within it its own deconstruction, its own rejection of imperialism. Like, it is imperial, you're absolutely right. There is a shadow of slavery and of genocide against indigenous peoples, First Nations. And there's also the counterculture that has been a part of America since its beginning. It's kind of like the, the Oscar Wilde quote, the longest running oldest tradition of America is its youth culture. <laughs> That it's always the place of youth culture. So it's an interesting question. Yeah. We also miss the Italians and the Irish people. Like America exploited them too. Like so, it's morally like a like it's the American Empire, which is a very small elite of America that have driven the country. So I, my point is very directed to them when I when I say this. So it's when the American Empire that's the problem, which is actually now eating up Kentucky, places like you know the American South, which are now being gobbled up by American corporations. So mm. by by tainting it in a certain way where the propaganda machine wants us to go, we don't see the real huma inhumanity that's happening to rural America also. So by, by limiting and boxing people in, in that, you're a public and you're Democrat and you forget the fact that, well, injustice is happening now and we all need to come together to fight it. Otherwise, your your country is decaying like in that manner. Mm -hmm. But I also see the, the failure to come together and fight against injustice as a moment in human history where we have had major large-scale movements like the civil rights movement and more recently in the early 2010s for instance Arab Spring uprising or I mean I'm just talking globally different movements the Indian farmers movement which is like the biggest in the world and you know yeah. that I was like well yeah exactly and so there are these mass movements but we're also facing something collectively as humans which is this radical shift away from large scale movements to more one on one connection, I, I believe, and we're seeing really the decay of institutions. And so I do wonder if in the future as institutions decay. Um, yeah, that was an interesting question. Well, hey, I'm going to show uh, I want to show your um, body graph here so people can kind of see who who has been talking, who's been communicating. And I, I know we are on a bit of a timeline here. I might understand we should we should wrap up a little bit. Is this, uh, yeah, so I, I but I, lo I love having you as a guest so much. So for the next few minutes, maybe I'll just let you talk any, anything you noticed about your travels here. I mean, um, you've obviously visited before. You said it, what your first experience was kind of seeing what a real American high school was like, not just from a TV show. This time, mm -hmm. what uh, what was added to your experience? I mean, you, you met a lot of really incredible people. You also got to experience the anonymity of the sort of sprawl, right? When you have such a sprawling country of endless freeways and endless um, convenience marts and fast food restaurants, it can be sort of de dehumanizing and demoralizing, at least to me. See, I love America, and especially the Southwest. Like I said before, I'm a fan of like Edward Abbey. I love like Wendell Berry. Like those have been my like Gore Vidal, like some of the American writers that I've deeply loved and learned writing from. And when I get a chance to go to like, for example, Utah or like, uh, like Colorado, like I feel like back in those novels and, and things and America, whatever, like the American empire, I dis, but the American people, because you're the first people of the world, like, you know, you're Rome citizens. So if, if revolution has to come, it has to come from you, not from like Syria. You understand? Like mm. if you rebel against an injustice and in an in evil empire, you have the power to topple everything else aside. And that's the real power which the corporations want you to forget. Because if you rebel, the world changes from your rebellion. It's like field theory, like in, mm. in some crazy way. You show the next field that this is possible, right? But people don't want that energy to kind of sync together. And that's like my kind of final point. Like, that's why when I come to America, I love the place. I love New Mexico. I love Colorado. I wish I get to see more of the South, more of like Arizona and Montana, Wyoming, like those parts. But I feel real hope with the American people. And that's why my critics, my, my criticism may be harsh, but it's only because I love, that's my second like country. If I had a second country, it would be that. Mm -hmm. and 
Oh, I, I, I love that point that being, being global citizens, um, that, that, that does, I mean, it, it, there is a dynamic at work there where, um, there has been such a, a large shadow, but there's also, um, being in the global spotlight and even developing the global stage. Like on the one hand, we can say, um, well, it's sad that there's such a homogenized culture that this monoculture has eradicated other cultural traditions. At the same time, there has been spreading of different ideas of different ways to live and different ways to be. And I think one of those is this very egalitarian message, which is also, I mean, a lot of it goes back, it is very Eurocentric as well, um, going back to France and the, the French Revolution and things like that. Um, now, obviously, other cultures and particularly indigenous traditions have carried this, you know, this uh, message and simply not been recognized. So there is an aspect that many cultures all over the world have been egalitarian at different times. But a lot of times, just because of their historical moment, they weren't globally egalitarian, right? Like there is something about now that we're in the age of the Internet and, and that there is this outsized influence. Uh, I think it's a great point that um, people in the U.S. do, do carry, um, carry this weight. I still see it as a one person at a time transformation where the mass movement, the, the age of the mass movement is waning, if not over already, only insofar as we are now at a point where everyone who has access to the internet has the ability to, um, you know, kind of once you get this basic fundamental connection to really be a global citizen and to have access to people who think differently. And now, of course, there are countries where there's a lot of censorship and where people don't have that access and where they cannot connect with people who might feel the same way they do about um, the injustices in the world and so on. But, but just because of how widespread that connection is and how possible it actually is, I, I am also hopeful that, um, that, that these things are going to happen one person at a time through connection, through, um, yeah, just like that things have become molecular, that rather than a million people all following one person, it's each person finding their own way or finding one other person that really speaks to them. And we have this kind of new era upon us. Um, but it was certainly a really a, a treat to meet you when you were here in Santa Fe. Uh, my first experience with you is at Synergia Ranch and just seeing how you moved through the crowd. You can, you can tell a lot about somebody, how they interact and how they, how they move through the world. I think our first interaction was you actually gave me a margarita, which was a delicious margarita. You were very welcoming. And I, I just appreciated um, a, a friendly face as it was my first time visiting Synergia Ranch. For those who don't know, um, I mean, Synergia is a pretty cool community that's been around um, since 1968. Definitely want to talk to more of those folks as well and hopefully get them on the podcast here. But uh, it's really nice meeting you there. Well, yeah, I, I have a little more time, but if, if you'd like to wrap up, I know, is it uh, is it very late for you where you are right now? Yeah, it's like already like 10, like past 10. Okay, well, I, I won't. But, but, I, but I, would add, I would end with one last message. You know, you said like it's one person at one time. If everyone just followed what, like Jesus said, love. If every person loved in the true sense, there would be no evil in this world. It's a very simple thing. If you just ah. knew what ethically love is from your heart and you actually acted on it, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, yellow, whatever you call other people, like, you know, whatever you are. Yeah. If you really just believe in love in the real sense, not like someone's attacking you and you're still loving them. No, let's be meek. But if you really believe in like love, I think the world's problems can be solved very simply. And I think that's my last message and, you know, the last in form of good wishes for all your viewers and yourself like it was been a treat well thank you thank you so much for that message and i also agree i i, I see that as um such an important thing and and uh i could i could sense your love of humanity uh, and your your kind of understanding when it, when i i met you and um it does have an invisible effect of invisibly raising the bar of the interactions, even just hanging out, playing cards, like we're playing poker and we're just, just chilling and, um, or we were playing Combrio. That was a lot of fun, but, uh, yeah. yeah, it absolutely does make a difference and it invisibly raises 
raises the frequency and raises the bar of the people around you. So I will let you go. Thank you so much for being a guest on the Frequencies podcast. I'll get this uploaded shortly and send you some links. And I'd love to have you back if there's ever anything you want to go in more detail, more depth. I'm sure my viewers would love to hear from you. Um, your your communications t today were very, I mean, very rich and very full. And, and uh, I really appreciate um, everything you had to say. So thank you. Thank until you next time. Yeah, really appreciate you. New Mexico. Mm. <laughs> Thanks.